Uh, welcome, everybody. Good afternoon or evening, depending on where you're calling in from. I know there are uh, several people here calling in from outside the United States. So thank you for um, joining us. Uh, my name is Paige Rivard. I'm the CEO of PWSA. I've been here about three years, and I actually have a son, Jake, who is 12, um, living with prader willi syndrome, and also a second rare genetic disorder, neurofibromatosis, or NF1. Um, so we're very excited to introduce ECHO for PWS. Uh, it's been a year or so in the making, and um, we, we hope you find tonight's session informative. Um, we hope to expand your knowledge and understanding of PWS and in, in turn, you know, improve the quality of care to our loved ones. And I think some of you have definitely participated in ECHO sessions before and are probably familiar with the concept. But before we get started, I wanted to just briefly share some uh, background for those who aren't familiar with ECHO. <clears throat> And ECHO stands for Extension of Extension for Community Healthcare Outcomes and was established at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque in 2003, primarily to address individuals with hepatitis C who were not receiving proper care. Um, ECHO utilizes the Zoom video conference technology by connecting providers to specialists and experts for mentoring, collaboration, and case-based learning. Um, and remember, <laughs> they utilized Zoom well before it was the standard that it is today. So it's pretty impressive. Um, ECHO is not only utilized in healthcare, but in many other fields now as well, such as education. Um, it, it's really expanded. So that, that is exciting. It spans over 40 countries and they've trained over 140,000 um, professionals. So it is a great, a great tool. ECHO has a um, set of guiding principles, and you may have heard about them. Um, they are amplification, using the technology to leverage scarce resources, share best practices to reduce discrepancies, apply case-based learning to master complexity, and evaluate and monitor outcomes using a web-based database. And some of the common phrases that you may have heard ECHO use, they say, you know, ECHO is to move knowledge instead of patience and all teach, all learn. So again, we're very excited. Um, there are very few rare disease organizations in the US that have launched ECHOs. And I know that we at PWSA, um, I have a couple of our staff members on the line with us tonight, Stacy Ward, who is our Director of Family Support, wow. and Lynn Garrick, who um, is our medical, um, she is a nurse and she's, she answers all our medical questions from families. And we get a lot of questions. We do a lot of peer-to-peer -peer consults um, for, for families. So, we really are all very passionate about extending the knowledge to the individuals in our communities and connecting them with professionals. So tonight we have two speakers that I'm happy to um, introduce to you. And I am not sure if Dr. McCandless is on yet, so I'll go ahead and introduce everybody. And then if he is on, he can let us know. But we um, we have Dr. Jessica Dewis. She, she is a clinical geneticist and pediatrician specializing in PWS. She's located at Children's Hospital in Colorado. I won't read her entire bio here, but she has a lot of experience in PWS, Angelman syndrome, and many other things. Um, she does clinical research. She participates in clinical trials. Um, she's just a wealth of knowledge. So we're very happy and honored to have Jessica with us um, tonight. She's gonna be doing the didactic piece. And then if Dr. McCandless um, joins us, he's gonna be doing the case study. And Dr. McCandless is also at the uh, Children's Hospital in Colorado. He's the chair of the Department of uh, Genetics and Metabolism. Um, so without any further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and um, shut my little PowerPoint presentation down here and turn it over to Jessica. At the end of the presentation, we do have a survey, it's a short survey. We would really appreciate um, you taking a few minutes to fill it out, just to give us some guidance of you know, how you felt the, the ECHO went, 
suggestions for future. And if you are a provider that's listening tonight and interested in um, sharing your expertise, we would love uh, to, to know that. You can reach out to us at info at pwsausa.org. Um, also, if you're a provider and you're not on our healthcare provider uh, list on our website and would like to be added as somebody who um, takes care of individuals with PWS, also reach out to us and we would be happy to talk to you and add you to our um, healthcare provider database. So I am um, going to turn it over to Jessica. Let's shut down my um, PowerPoint here. Can you see my slides? Um, Jessica. I think it was... Yes, I can. Can you? Can everybody see Jessica's slides? Yes, we can. Okay. I can see them. Oh, great. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Take it away, well, Jessica. <laughs> well, thank you so much to Paige and PWSA USA for having me this afternoon, evening, depending on, I guess, middle of the night, depending on where you are across the world. Um, I'm very excited to be uh, presenting the first Echo uh, for PWSA USA. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the diagnostic pathway to prader willi syndrome and really focusing on genetics in PWS 101. So my main talking points are going to be uh, to discuss genetic and epigenetic mechanisms which cause PWS, um, a diagnostic algorithm to approach PWS that's been um, simplified to just the things that you need to know uh, when you're seeing a patient in clinic, and then some uh, brief correlation of genetic mechanism of PWS and clinical features really to exemplify why it is so important to dive in and figure out the underlying genetic cause of PWS so that we can take the best care of the patients that we're seeing. So I thought I would first start with some clinical criteria for PWS, and this was originally published in 2001 um, by actually one of my mentors, um, Mural Gane Agun, who uh, was working with Susie Cassidy at the time. And so these are the original clinical features that are published or, or the up upgraded clinical features that have been published that we still pretty much go by today. But I want to highlight some areas that should add PWS back to your differential, even if you're not seeing these particular features. So early on, we think of PWS with significant hypotonia and poor suck, difficulty gaining weight. So these individuals often end up in the neonatal intensive care unit because of the significance of their low muscle tone and a lack of interest in feeding. Um, as they get older, the hypotonia continues to be a concern. Um, delays become more apparent as they get older as well. Um, and so those clinical features of hypotonia are, and developmental delays are present in over 90% of individuals with PWS. Um, but as they get older, you can hear more about excessive eating or obsession with food. We're really thinking about how do we define hyperphagia in PWS? And um, definitely there seems to be some um, obsessive compulsive component to it um, and obesity that develops if environment is not well controlled. As individuals get older, cognitive impairment and a really specific developmental behavioral uh, clinical features that we can see that really are focused on insistence on save, sameness, obsessive compulsive. Um, you can also see um, many endocrinopathies, including hypothalamic hypogonadism. And the, there are a few features that we really have uh, seen as we've seen more and more individuals with PWS that could also be hallmarks that we see. So thinking about the lack of interest in feeding, adding stubbornness, need for structure, and some of those OCD um, features that we've already talked about, um, and that those rapid mood changes from A to Z in seconds can be a hallmark of PWS, perseverative behaviors, getting stuck on topics, um, and skin picking also. 
um, are important features to consider as you're thinking about who should be tested for PWS. And PWS is unique from a genetic perspective because it does require thinking about it in and of itself to ensure that you're comprehensively testing and ruling out PWS. So without further ado, I'll um, jump into that. There are you could add to that some excessive daytime sleepiness and cataplexy seizures, but I'm going to move on to the um, the genetic piece of it. So, Prader-Willi syndrome is caused by lack of expression of genes on the paternal copy of chromosome 15. So that is a mouthful. What does that even mean? Well, the First thing we need to do is take a step back and talk a little bit about chromosome 15. And chromosome 15 is one of a few unique regions of our chromosomes where we have we we have two copies of this chromosome like all the other chromosomes except for one thing that's unique here is that part of the genes only get turned on from the paternal copy or the father's copy, and part of the genes only get turned on from the mother's copy. And so if you're missing either the maternal or the paternal copy, or even just expression of those genes, you can have different disorders that look very different. Um, and so with with Prader-Willi syndrome, in that critical region, we know that there are specific genes, including the SNRPIN gene and these non-coding RNAs that are within this region that are only expressed from dad's copy. If we look at the maternal copy, the maternal copy is what we call imprinted in this region, meaning that the maternal genes that we just discussed that are turned on on dad's copy, such as SNRPIN, are actually completely silenced on the maternal copy. And that's important because if you're missing or you don't have appropriate expression of these genes through several mechanisms that we'll talk about, you don't have these genes functional at all. And so that's what causes Prader-Willi syndrome. There is often a lot of confusion about what imprinted means and think of imprinting as a mechanism by which the genes are silenced. So in Prader-Willi syndrome, the genes are ex this particular region 15Q11.2 to Q13, which is like the address on the chromosome. These particular genes are turned on on dad's copy or expressed, and they're imprinted or silenced on the maternal copy. And this is a, a blown up region of this particular address. If you think of it as the, we're on the Q arm or the long arm of chromosome 15, Chromosome 15 is also unique in that it's an acrocentric chromosome. And so you just have a small satellite instead of a short arm or a P arm. So P is for petite when we're talking about chromosomes. So you have just a satellite here and then the long arm is uh, Q. And then if we blow up this region that we're talking about, you can see which specific genes are in this region. Um, and some of the ones I mentioned would be um, the SNRPIN gene, um, but you can see all these genes right here, um, largely in this region, such as MAJL2 is one that's in the PWS critical region, um, NDN or Nectin gene, um, the SNRPIN gene, which is um, which has a, a long region that includes um, some of these uh, SNOW RNAs or non-coding RNAs in this in this region as well. And so this blue shows which genes are specifically expressed from the paternal copy. And then the pink here on the maternal copy, these are the genes, we're not gonna talk about these today, that are expressed from the maternal copy and silenced on the paternal copy. So, what causes Prader-Willi syndrome? Um, and we talked about it, it's that expression or those genes in that region are not able to, are, are not working on the paternal copy. And when we think about this, there's actually several mechanisms by which this can occur. The most common or in 70% of cases is that there's actually a deleted part from the paternal copy of chromosome 15. And in a 
the one thing to know here, this is a little bit too much detail, but along this region, um, there's along the region where the chromosomes align on chromosome 15, there's a lot of repetitive elements. And one of the reasons that this deletion occurs is when the chromosomes go to align um, and then to separate to make an egg cell or a, sp a sperm cell, what happens is that that alignment is not in tune. And then when they separate, you end up with a deleted miss or a missing piece in this case. So that is often a completely random event. The other possibility that could cause this is that you actually inherit two copies of your maternal or your mom's chromosome 15. So you don't have a copy of the paternal chromosome 15. And we're gonna talk about the most common mechanism by which that happens, but that's called um, uniparental disomy. And then the other, um, mechanism by which this occurs is called an imprinting center defect or an imprinting defect. And what happens here is that our body is very dependent on marking our germ cells, so our eggs, our sperm, as coming from mom or from dad. And what we think happens with the imprinting defect is that we're not able to appropriately remark our chromosomes as coming from us. So for example, your father has one copy of chromosome 15 from your grandmother and one copy of chromosome 15 from your grandfather. And if, and in all of your father's cells, he has to remark that cell as coming from him. So all of the imprinted chromosomes from his, from his mother or your grandmother has to be remarked as coming from your father. And that process can, can um, go awry in which you're not able to remark the chromosome. And so when you pass it on, it seems as if it's coming from the, um, from a maternal copy as opposed to a paternal copy. So those are the three mechanisms by which you can have prader willi syndrome that we know the most about, a deletion, uniparental disomy, and an imprinting center defect. Um, and by far the most common is the deletion. Um, UPD um, in this study was about almost 30%, and then an imprinting center defect in 2%. You can also have a translocation in which you have um, chromosome 15 and another chromosome in which they've switched places. So you still have all your chromosome material, but there's some mislocation or stuck together chromosomes. And that can interrupt um, the imprinting control region and cause uh, Prader-Willi syndrome as well. Um, but that is a ve very small percentage of cases, but that's why this doesn't, um, that's one possibility as well. The When you have um, the maternal copy affected, you have Angelman syndrome, which can occur by some similar mechanisms, um, but I'm not going to go into detail about that. So I said I would come back to the mechanism of uniparental disomy, and the reason for that is that this is a common question that I actually get um, from the patients that I see in clinic. And so what happens with uniparental disomy is actually you end up with um, a cell that has actually three copies of chromosome 15 in it, two that either... Oftentimes this can happen if the chromosomes are stuck together. It, and so you end up with two copies from the egg cell and one copy from the sperm cell, and you end up with a triploid conceptus, or you have three chromosomes. And this is not compatible with life. And so what the cell does is says, hey, I have too many chromosome 15s in here, and it will kick out one of those chromosome 15s. and it doesn't distinguish between whether it's a maternal or a paternal copy. And so you can end up with those two copies of the maternal chromosome 15. And so that's the most common cause of um, UPD. And so if there's any take home point from this discussion, it's that um, methylation studies, which tell us which copies of chromosome 15 are present 
um, is the most important test that you can send to diagnose prader willi syndrome. And this will be abnormal in more than 99% of cases of individuals with PWS. So we'll often say, um, acceptance of rare instances that if the methylation studies are normal, we've essentially ruled out prader willi syndrome. This is the only test that will pick up all three of those mechanisms of prader willi syndrome. Um, and so it's really important if you're thinking about prader willi syndrome to send up this methylation test. And like I said, it, it tells us which copies of chromosome 15 are present. Is it the maternal copy or is it the paternal copy or is it one of each? And this is a nice algorithm that was published um, that I think is nicely simplifies how you can think about testing. So you always want to, if you're thinking about prader willi syndrome, you want to be thinking about doing that methylation test. If that comes back normal, then PWS is very unlikely, as we've discussed. If it's abnormal, then you want to do some additional testing from a genetic standpoint to really understand the underlying molecular mechanism of PWS. So we usually think about, since it's the most common, to start with um, testing um, no, to see if there's a deleted part of chromosome 15. And so you can do something called a FISH study, which is a much older test um, that basically sends a single probe to look for that 15Q11.2 region. Um, and if it comes back that instead of in the cell having two areas with of that region, but only one, then that's consistent with the deletion. The chromosomal microarray or CMA is the more comprehensive test that we typically recommend um, these days. And that test actually looks across all 23 pairs of your chromosomes, looking for any small missing or extra parts or pieces of chromosomes and can get down to a pretty small um, 500 kilobase size to look for any small missing or extra pieces. So, and even smaller than that, but that's typically the threshold at which a lab will, will report um, a small deletion. And so that can identify a deletion as a mechanism for prader willi syndrome. The other thing that the chromosomal microarray can detect is not well reflected here, but we also look at single nucleotide polymorphisms or common genetic changes in the letter that don't change necessarily the function of the genes, but um, can tell us if there's enough variation in those letters to identify that um, the chromosome came from one from mom and one from dad, or to tell us if there's so much similarity between those letters, which should have some natural variation between two people to say that um, there's uniparental disomy or, this, or two copies of the same chromosome. Um, and so we often are able to get the information we need about the molecular mechanism from the single nucleotide polymorphism CMA or SNP um, microarray. If that's normal, um, sometimes more detailed studies to look along the length of the um, chromosome and look at those letters is needed to really understand if there's biparental inheritance or inheritance that's um, one from mom and one from dad, or to tell us if there's actually is UPD. And depending on when the um, cause of the UPD was either meiosis one, so early on or later meiosis two, it can, um, it can require some specialized testing and comparison of the child to parents. Um, and then if that's normal, then we often recommend doing some additional analysis along the imprinting control region to look to see if there's a small deletion that could be in that SNRPN gene. So the SNRPN gene carries the imprinting control region for chromosome 15. Um, and so if we look in that region and we see a small deleted part, that's really important because that can give us some information about recurrence, which I'm going to talk about. 
So this is what testing might look like if you sent a chromosomal microarray. So what this is showing is all the little probes along the chromosome um, in this region of the of our chromosomes is very probe rich. You can see all these little probes looking to see if that region is there or if it's missing or um, or deleted. And you can see that in this region, which is 15Q12 in that critical region, you can see for this particular patient, they were, they only detected one dose of probes. And so that's consistent with a deletion um, that includes this critical region of chromosome 15. Um, so why is it important to go further? So say you get the diagnosis of Prader-Willi, but we don't know the mechanism. Why do we want to know that? And in part, that's because there is some correlation between the molecular subtype or the genotype um, and the clinical features of the phenotype. Um, and so in particular, um, this is really important for um, psychiatric phenotypes. So psychosis and autism spectrum disorders are more common in UPD. There's different varying studies that have shown some specific genotype phenotype correlation, but these are the ones that are the probably the most consistent that we see in the medical literature. So if you're thinking about, um, you know, features that might suggest that there's an increased risk of those diagnoses, um, then we, um, then it's important to know that as you manage the individual and think about their care, what therapies they might uh, respond to, for example. And then the other reason is that recurrence risk is a really important piece. There's a few rare causes of recurrent um, Prader-Willi syndrome in a family and that it's really important for us to identify that so we can provide um, appropriate guidance to families. So this is um, a algorithm that um, I worked on with um, Dr. Merlin Butler. Um, it's a lot more detailed than um, the one that I presented, which I think is easier to follow um, in terms of diagnostic algorithm. But there's a few things I want to point out in particular related to that risk of recurrence. So if we look at this, so in the case of an individual who has a deletion, um, which can be classified as either a type one or type two deletion based on the size of it. One thing that we will recommend um, just to be sure that the recurrence risk is low is to do either a karyotype in the child or a parental karyotype to rule out a balanced translocation. And a balanced translocation is what I described before, where you have one part of a chromosome, say chromosome 14, attached to chromosome 15, and then the other part of chromosome 14 attached to the other, uh, or I'm sorry, the two copies of a chromosome that have switched places. So you have all your material, but it's just switched places so that you still have all your chromosome 14 and all your chromosome 15, they're just in the wrong place. And in most cases, when we look at the chromosomal microarray, there will be some evidence that there is a translocation. So for example, in the child, if we see that there's both um, a deletion on chromosome 15 and an extra part of chromosome 14, that is more clear to us that there is a balanced translocation or a potential balance translocation in a parent. And one thing that's really important to know about that is because the parent has all of their material, they would never know that they had that change until they have a child who has um, a chromosomal abnormality, in this case, Prader-Willi syndrome. And then the other time that I think it's really important to be aware of recurrence risk is that imprinting center. If there's a small deletion in the imprinting center that is present um, it, on the paternal copy and the paternal copy can't be remarked as coming from father, then that will cause every time that particular chromosome is passed on from the father, there will be a 50% 
recurrence risk. So each so each time the father has a chance of passing on the copy that doesn't have a genetic change and and a 50% chance of passing on the copy that has that small deletion. And so that's why that's a 50% recurrence risk. Um, so those are the two instances in which we would want families to be aware that there's a potential for a recurrence risk. So some key points, um, methylation testing is the first line if you're suspecting Prader-Willi syndrome. Um, chromosomal testing can capture the most common subtypes of Prader-Willi syndrome, certainly a deletion, which is about 70%. And then most instances of UPD were able to capture with that SNP microarray. Um, so that is often the first step in terms of identifying molecular subtype of Prader-Willi syndrome. And then rarely additional testing may be needed to determine recurrence risk for families. Okay, and I'll stop there and be happy to take any questions. Thank, thank you, Dr. Dewis. Um, I was going to mention, if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A. Um, we did have one in the chat, and so I can go ahead and read that. Um, <clears throat> it's from Paul. He said, I work in a clinic that is often doing autism evaluations. When we make a diagnosis, diagnosis of autism, we will frequently do CMA, although it should detect the deletion mechanism of PWS. Will the methylation study also be needed to screen for the other two genotypes of PWS? Good question. So there's a couple of reasons you will still need the methylation test. One of them is that the chromosomal microarray will not distinguish between whether it's the paternal copy of chromosome 15 impacted or the maternal copy. Um, and that is yeah. really important um, because we do have some cases, for example, um, where there's um, features of prader really that are present in Angelman. And so we've had some cases even come to our prader Willie clinic um, and B Angelman, more likely mosaic Angelman syndrome, which would not be a deletion, but still an important point. Um, and then if you're suspecting prader Willie syndrome, a chromosomal microarray will not rule out that diagnosis. And so yeah. you will okay. need that was sort to of my do question methylation. Yeah, and that's hard because all the the the, so, the characteristics of Prader Willi that you listed are in autism, <laughs> and oh, so sure. you know, so we're a lot of people these days are approaching this from the autism side, and obviously we want to screen for Prader Willi as as one of many different genetic causes of autism. But I suspect that most autism diagnosis clinics are not routinely ordering methylation tests for Prader-Willi syndrome, but they are ordering CMA a lot. So it's just good to know. Right. Thanks for explaining that. Yeah, absolutely. And um, there definitely, I mean, I there have been some cases, in fact, recently that I've been um, consulted on where they picked up broader release syndrome in an autism clinic because that rigidity and some of those perseverative behaviors can certainly end up um, there. So it is important to consider, especially after they've gone through extensive testing, even whole exome sequencing, and they don't have a diagnosis to think about what you could be missing and, and Prader really is on that list. Thanks, very helpful. Mm -hmm. There we go. We have another question. Can you explain the methylation abnormality relation to the genotypes? Yeah, so the methylation test will essentially tell you um, that whether there's a paternal copy uh, of um, the genes present or absent. It won't tell you the genotype. So what it will tell you is we don't see any evidence that there's any of these genes being expressed from the paternal copy um, by looking at methylation. So it's looking more at that imprinting side of things, but essentially what it's telling you is, do we see a paternal 
copy of the chromosome present? Do we see a maternal copy of the chromosome present? The additional testing that we went through is needed to identify the subtype of prader willi So the methylation will all look the same um, for, um, that's not true of all techniques like MLPA, um, which is the more common technique that we use now will tell you if there's a deletion there. But for the most part, if you think of methylation testing, which I think is probably the most straightforward, it's only telling you, is there a paternal copy of chromosome 15 present? Is there a maternal copy of chromosome 15 present or expressed, if that makes sense? Is the father's, uh, father's genes, the paternal genes, are they methylated or not methylated? So that's so what I want to in this particular region, the paternal genes are unmethylated or expressed, and the maternal copy is methylated. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, another question we have in our PWS clinic, when testing a suspected case of PWS in newborns, we suggest that a DNA methylation test be run and then a microarray. microarray. It has been beneficial to get the microarray while impatient, as we have some difficulties getting insurance approval at a later date. So that's a great statement, I guess. <laughs> Not necessarily a question, but thanks for sharing that uh, tip. Anybody else have similar experience with that? Can I just add, Paige? This is Sean McCandless. I'm Hi, Dr. McCandless. <laughs> Um, I, I typically do the tests at the same time, because if you think about it, if the methylation is abnormal, the next test is a chromosome microarray to figure out whether there's a deletion in the Prader-Willi syndrome region or not. If the methylation test is normal and you don't think it's Prader-Willi or Angelman syndrome, the next most common cause of profound hypotonia in a baby is, or intellectual disability or other thing, is going to be a chromosome a, a, chromosome abnormality. So the chromosome microarray, you're always going to do that test regardless. You're going to do it if the methylation suggests Prader-Willi to figure out the cause of the Prader-Willi. If it's not Prader-Willi syndrome, you're going to do the, you're going to do the microarray to help understand what is the diagnosis. So that it makes perfect sense to do them at the same time. Um, I do I, that as well. Yeah, I would totally agree with that. I think especially if accessibility of testing inpatient makes it makes it easier to send both at the same time you know you're you're going to you're going to want to send the chromosomal testing either way i just emphasize the methylation testing cuz there's a lot of families we see who have had chromosomal microarray that's normal and the family's been told they've ruled out prader willi syndrome and that's there are still several mechanisms, you know, if we haven't detected UPD or we haven't detected an imprinting center defect where it still could be Prader-Willi syndrome. So you want to make sure the methylation test has been done. Great. Um, there, there's a question here. I think you may have answered it, but I'll just put it out there. Could you repeat the test for subtyping PWS? So the testing you'll do for subtyping PWS, no, I have to click the actual arrow. It won't let me use my arrow buttons, but um, this is why I like this slide the very best because it's um, pretty straightforward. So once, if you know it's Prader-Willi syndrome, you're going to send a chromosomal microarray. Um, and if that's negative, then you might do specific uniparental disomy studies, which are the DNA polymorphism analysis. And if that's um, negative, we often assume that it's an imprinting center defect, but the possibility, there's a 5% possibility that, that we could detect an imprinting center deletion, um, which is basically that test is a spelling out the gene SNRPIN or sequencing SNRPIN to look for a small deletion that could cause the imprinting center defect. And that one is really important to do because it could have that 50% recurrence risk. So those would be the, the, test, the three tests to think about molecular subtyping to figure out the mechanism of Prader-Willi syndrome. 
Wonderful. Any any other questions? Well, I um, I know Dr. McCandless is here and has joined us, and so I gave a very brief bio um, on you. But the next the next portion of this would be a case study. So Dr. McCandless was going to walk us through a case study for Prader-Willi syndrome, and then we will have some more time for Q&A as well. Thank you, um, I appreciate that. And um, just to jump right in, uh, this is, a, this is a, an actual case that's been reported in the literature. A three-year-old comes to clinic for evaluation for suspected Prader-Willi, 42-week gestation, appropriate for gestational age, uh, 36-year-old mother. Um, the baby was noted to be quite floppy and lethargic in the first six months of life and had a poor suck. However, at six months of age, weighed 10 kilos and then 15 kilos, so quite on the large end of things at 18 months. Uh, that that itself is not strongly typical of Prader-Willi syndrome. Often in the first year of life, the kids tend to be on the small side and have trouble gaining weight. And then the appetite starts a little bit later and they uh, gain weight a little bit later. Development was delayed. He walked at 18 months, spoke first words at two and a half years. At around after the age of two and certainly by um, you know two and a half, the family had noted a, a markedly increased appetite and his weight was much above the 97th percentile. And uh, at, um, at 42 months of age, he was uh, at, so at three and a half years of age, he was at the 50th percentile for a 10 year old child. Um, and um, his uh, height was uh, at the 75th percentile. So he wasn't short, but he's also quite overweight. And as you all know, that kids that are overweight, that tends to drive linear growth. And so the short stature of Prader Willi can be sometimes hidden um, by the by the weight. Testicles were undescended, and he has mild generalized hypotonia uh, with advanced bone age by nine months uh, with a standard deviation of 6.7 months. So again, advanced bone age is typical of the weight-driven excessive height. So referred for Prader-Willi syndrome. Um, in this case, well, first off, uh, is, is Prader-Willi syndrome high or low on your differential? You can raise your hand if you think if you're thinking Prader-Willi syndrome is likely. Uh, if you're not sure, that's okay too. May I have the next slide, please? Or can I, yeah. Uh, so the pediatrician sent high resolution chromosomes. And just to be clear, this publication was from 1996. So the case was probably worked up in the early nineties. And so the high resolution chromosomes were a much more common test than they are now. Almost certainly today, the pediatrician would have sent a chromosome microarray. And that's really important because they might have missed this diagnosis if they just did the chromosome microarray, because the microarray tells you whether there's a piece of DNA that's missing or if there's duplicated DNA, but it does, that does not tell you whether the DNA is in the right place. And in this case, uh, you can see, and let me see if I can um, get a marker of some kind here. Uh, can you see an arrow? No. Uh, let me then just, you can see here uh, in this chromosome 15, here's a normal chromosome, oops. Uh, here's a normal chromosome 15, and here is the other chromosome 15 that is missing a big chunk. And here's a chromosome 19 that is normally quite, uh, normally quite short next to it. and um, so here's the normal chromosome 19, and here's a chromosome 19 that has a big extra piece attached to it. So this is a translocation. It's apparently balanced. If you look at the ideogram here of where they think the breakpoints are, uh, you can see that the um, this there's. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have an. I, I don't have a mouse that you can see, an arrow that you can see. 
Um, let me, excuse me for just a moment. So you can see that this region here has now moved from chromosome 15 onto chromosome 19. And this little piece of chromosome 19 is now attached to chromosome 15. So you have a derivative chromosome 15 that's missing a big chunk of 15 and has an extra piece of 19 on it. And you, thank you. And you've got a derivative chromosome 19 that's missing the little tip, but has a big extra chunk of from the middle of from the middle of the long arm of chromosome 15 on it. So this looks to the eye like a, a, an apparently balanced translocation. But when you do the, when they uh, when they can I have the next slide, please? When they analyze the breakpoints, they find that it's the break is right in the middle of the SNRP N gene, which is one of the very important genes for Prader-Willi syndrome. And then they, when they go on to do, uh, look, and this was a research study, they went on to look for mRNA, evidence of that you're making a transcript from the gene. They didn't find any mRNA from SNRPN. So it's not, that protein is not being expressed. Now, this study is just to show that when you look at chromosomes, sometimes you can see polymorphisms in the way the banding patterns appear. And so in the mom here on the right, you can see that her chromosome 15s look, they're both normal, but they're very different in appearance. And the dad's chromosome 15, again, they both look normal, but they're very different in appearance. When you look at the baby, you can see that there's this very small chromosome 15, which is the derivative that has the big deletion on it. And then the other chromosome 15 is clearly the same as that copy from the mom. So that this is an example of how you can use a gross banding um, variant to identify the parent of origin. We would never, we wouldn't really do this anymore, but it's an, it's an interesting historical study. If may I have the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so this is the methylation analysis that Dr. Dewis was talking about. And this is done in the more, the more old fashioned way, which is where you use restriction enzymes, one, one of which is methylation sensitive. So it, it is blocked from cutting if the DNA is methylated. Um, and, so, um, and so what you can see here, is it, let's look at the SNRP end promoter on the right first, because this is the more traditional. When you have um, the, uh, when you have, there's two bands, this long band is at the top, is the one that the methylation sensitive probe does not cut there. So if it's, if that region is methylated, it won't cut. So you will you have the longer band from that allele, from that version of the gene. And then this smaller band is cut by the methylation sensitive restriction enzyme. So you have the short piece and the long piece. And that tells you that you have one copy from father, which is the short piece, and one copy from mother, which is the long piece. It was not, it wasn't cut because it's highly methylated. Um, and then if you look at this sample from a patient with Angelman syndrome, you can see that you have the short piece. So unmethylated DNA is there, but the methylated DNA is absent. So there's no methylated copy. So there's no maternal contribution of chromosome 15 in this sample. Next is a control from a Prader-Willi syndrome patient, and it's just the opposite. The paternal contribution, the unmethylated band that's short, is absent, but the long, longer methylated band is present at the, at the top. So this is Prader-Willi syndrome. You have the maternal methylated band, but you do have absent unmethylated piece of DNA in that region. When you look at the sample from the patient we're talking about, you can see that the methylation pattern is different. So this is an example of a case where you have disruption of the SNRP N gene. The SNRP N gene is broken by this translocation, this apparently balanced translocation. There's no expression of SNRP N, so you're not making protein from the SNRP N, but the methylation pattern appears normal. This is exquisitely rare 
but we show it to say that you have to be careful and that there's the um, that if the if you're highly suspicious clinically of Prader Willi syndrome, that's when you need to worry about the rare mechanisms of disease. So you do methylation, it's normal, and you look at the kid and you say, boy, this kid still looks like Prader Willi syndrome. That's when you might consider doing uh, the chromosome analysis to look for a translocation. You might consider sequencing some of the genes like SNRPN, although SNRPN um, mutations are not really commonly described, but there's another syndrome of another gene in the region, uh, MAGE-L gene, that causes something called Schaaf yang which can look very similar to Prader-Willi syndrome. You can have a missing piece of just a, the, the, a, a, at the far end of the SNRP-N gene, there's some what are called microRNAs that are very critical, and you can have just a tiny little deletion of one of those microRNAs that will cause a very similar phenotype to Prader-Willi syndrome. So going back to the slide, in this case, the um, they also just wanted to be sure they weren't missing something. So they did, they looked at the methylation of a different gene in this region. And remember that each gene, the methylation, the, the imprinting occurs in the promoter region of the gene and the methylation turns off that particular gene. So they looked at a different gene um, which is the the PW seventy one is the is the name of the gene, and um, what they found here is that the uh, in a in a normal control you have uh, both the methylated and the unmethylated version in a patient. Excuse me, um, this is the I, I said it backwards in this one because in this one the probe, the shorter probe, the one that's cut by the methylation sensitive probe is actually the, is the one that's missing in the Prader-Willi syndrome patient. So I don't wanna make this overly confusing, but you have to know what, what the restriction enzymes and the methylation pattern, how they work in this one. But in this case, you can see you're missing one of the bands here and you have another band. So in this case, the longer band is present, the short one is missing. So I guess I guess that is the same. So the, the unmethylated version is missing, the short version. And so that parent, the, the paternal copy, the copy from dad is missing. Um, here's a patient with another another patient with a deletion. You can see that essentially the copy from father is missing. The maternal copy that's highly methylated is present. And here's the translocation patient again that has both present, both methylated and unmethylated DNA present. So again, normal methylation, but the patient has disruption of the SNRP-N gene that's causing the Prader-Willi syndrome-like phenotype. I'm not, today we might not call this Prader-Willi syndrome, we might call it Prader-Willi syndrome-like syndrome, but for all intents and purposes, it's Prader-Willi syndrome. And this child certainly clinically seemed like Prader-Willi syndrome. Um, have the next slide, please. Uh, so I think that's all the slides and we thank you. Happy to answer any questions about that. Just the one thing to say is I think that the uh, it's typically it makes the most sense to do the chromosome microarray at the same time you do the methylation analysis. The methylation analysis is very important if you and you have to do it if you're concerned about Prader-Willi syndrome or Angelman syndrome. And so if, if Prader-Willi is on the differential, certainly if it's a very floppy baby who's not feeding well, Prader-Willi syndrome is the most common diagnosis. So that should be the first test you do. We always do the microarray at the same time. And in our lab, they will let us do uh, uh, a kind of rapid chromosome analysis where they only look at five cells, but we can do that at the same time as the microarray for a small additional cost. And that gives us a lot of reassurance that we're not missing a translocation like this one uh, all at the same time. Um, so uh, thank you for your attention. Happy to answer any questions. Dr. McCandless, can I just ask a, a question, quick question? You mentioned um, that you might not call that Prader-Willi syndrome and you might call it Prader-Willi syndrome-like. We're hearing uh, from other geneticists that they're not using that anymore. And as a result, people aren't getting services. So I was just wondering from a, a genetic perspective what that means. Yeah, so um, I, I think, Stacey, you, you've actually said the most important thing, which is that if we want to give the person 
the diagnosis that's most accurate and is going to get them the most services that they need. So in that case, I think it, if, if use, we used, we used to use the term prader willi syndrome like to indicate that we were, weren't certain that it was exactly the same and we weren't certain that the prognosis was exactly the same. <clears throat> but it's more important that the child get the services they need. So I think it would be very appropriate to use, to just call that prader willi syndrome um, and to make sure you're getting services. Uh, <clears throat> but at Dr. Dewis and I would both counsel the family that we're a little bit less confident about what the extent of what might happen to this child in the future. And so we might be a little bit more reserved in saying, you know, here's what you can expect for the future. Um, so and, and I think, that, and, and we have the same issue with the, we tend to be a little bit more now likely to use a more molecular diagnosis and say, this is a, a just this is a SNRP N deficient. You might say SNRP N deficiency, Prader Willi phenotype would be another way you could make a diagnosis that most geneticists would be comfortable with. Uh, I agree that using that, adding the word like to the end of a diagnosis is probably not a best practice. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Jessica that. or Dr. Dewis, do you have thoughts about that? Um. No, I, I typically still would call that prader willi syndrome. I agree that the data that we have about the clinical features of PWS is going to be a lot more aligned with the other phenotype, the other genotypes we talked about, like a deletion. We know a whole lot more about what that looks like, but I still would call it prader willi syndrome, and we would still treat it similarly. It, it may be that the guidance we give about long-term impact and what features they'll have, we may have to learn along with them. Okay. Uh, there's a question that, is there any harm in getting a dual diagnosis of autism mm -hmm. and PWS? Not, not at all. In fact, oftentimes we will end up going down that route, particularly it comes back to Stacy's question actually about services. And a lot of times the, for example, the behavioral therapy that helps with autism um, can be incredibly helpful for some of the rigid behaviors and the repetitive behaviors that we see in PWS. And so um, certainly there's not harm in making that diagnosis particular of autism in addition. Um, to ensure that the patient gets the services that they need. And I can I would, yeah. speak to that as well. Just uh, personal experience, you know, our son has uh, PWS. We did get an autism diagnosis um, and he has UPD. So he has a little more of that, you know, that subtype that we were talking about behavioral, a lot of behavioral issues. So we were able to get ABA services in the school. So again, just to reiterate, um, for him, I think it has been very beneficial to have the dual diagnosis. Um, to build on that question, how do you support families to distinguish the difference or is there a need to distinguish? I do think that it can be really helpful um, to talk with the therapist that's working with them and distinguish some of the differences that you might see between PWS and autism, uh, because there could be some strategies um, that work for autism that might not be the best strategy for the ABA therapist to use for individuals with PWS. Um, but from the standpoint of um, really distinguishing between the two, Outside of that reason, I can't think of another one. I think it's important not to just assume that the if if the patient has char has characteristic behaviors that point to a diagnosis of autism, it's valuable to to make that diagnosis accurately and not just sort of write it write it off as oh it's just Prader Willi syndrome, because tip. Typically, children with prader willi syndrome don't meet diagnostic criteria for autism. They may have some overlapping characteristics, but it's it's the majority of kids with prader willi syndrome don't meet diagnostic criteria for autism. And those that do really benefit from having as 
Dr. Dewis said, and, and as Paige said, benefit from having that diagnosis and getting appropriate services that match the diagnosis. Sometimes we do think that those same services might be beneficial for somebody who doesn't quite meet formal diagnostic criteria for autism. And then you can sort of have the discussion with the family about whether it might be valuable to apply that label for the purposes of getting what you consider to be really helpful services. Great. Um, I've had a couple of people who've said they had to drop off, but have said that this has been very well organized. Oh, here's somebody that well organized and informative. Um, so I think, you know, if we have more questions, we definitely have some time, but I just wanted to thank Dr. Dewis and Dr. McCandless um, for being our very first ECHO um, presenters. And um, I think this is going to be a great benefit to not only our community, but to other professionals that are taking care of our loved ones with PWS. And, and you know, I know our pediatrician is uh, one who has a couple in her clinic, but has been learning along the way. So I think the more we can educate, um, obviously at PWSA, we're passionate about educating as many as we can. Um, and our next ECHO, we are hoping to do these quarterly right now to kick off. We do have our national convention in June, so we are going to move, wait till August. Um, and we're going to, um, our target is uh, August for endocrinology. So if you're interested, you know, we will be sending out more information on that as well. Um, but any other questions right now? I know that we get a lot of questions on genetics <laughs> um, at PWSA. So there are def it's definitely a hot topic. And um, I don't know, Lynn, do you have, Lynn gets all of our, our medical questions. So do you have any, uh, anything that you want to add? I do think that for the, those people out there, um, our website has a wealth of information, including those um, flow charts for diagnosing. Um, that is on our on our website under the medical A to Z section. So if you're ever thinking, wow, those were really great flow charts, um, they're on our website. And also, if you ever have any questions, we do offer, I think Paige mentioned, a peer-to-peer -peer consult. So if you ever want to get in touch with Dr. Dewis or Dr. McCandless, um, we can help facilitate those types of interactions, not only between geneticists or any number of um, specialties for the physicians. So, Can, can I just, uh, I'd like to ask Dr. Dewis a question. Um, sometimes <laughs> on the, sometimes on the chromosome microarray report, they will say this is consistent with a type one deletion or a type two deletion? What does that mean? And what is the significance of it? Um, yeah, so it's related to the size of the uh, deletion. So a class two um, or type two, um, we use different terms in Angelman versus Prader really to make it as complicated as possible. But it, for paternal copy, we say type two, and that is typically about five megabases in size. And then a type one is typically about um, seven megabases in size. So it has to do with where the breakpoints are, but it's generally, they generally estimate which is which based on the size of the deleted part. Um, it hasn't been shown um, to have any genotype phenotype correlation really in terms of significance of, of type one versus type two. There are some case studies where there's even smaller deletions. So, um, you know, e even some as small as 100 KB and those do tend to have some, um, features that are, depending on where the deletion is, that may be less, um, the, the severity of the phenotype tends to be less if it's a really tiny deletion. Um, it's still, and there's a lot of discussion about whether that should be called broader really, but um, in general, type one versus type two doesn't have too much significance. Uh, thank you for that question. As you know, I get a lot of parents calling me saying, 
What are the differences between type one and type two? And also, which one is worse? What does that mean? So that's very helpful. Also, um, I think you might've touched on this too. We are getting seen a lot and getting more questions about mosaicism. And I'm not sure, I think you might've had that on one of those uh, slides, but that's also something that is coming up more frequently than I've in the past, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have gotten a lot of questions recently about mosaicism. I will say I don't, I haven't seen many mosaic PWS individuals, but I've seen a whole lot of mosaic Angelman individuals, and they look phenotypically a lot like Prader Willi. They have hyperphagia, the, you know, delays and development um, in. And so oftentimes the question is, I've been told my child has Prader Willi and Angelman. Is that possible? And then when we review the testing, even though they may have clinical features that could be seem more consistent with Prader Willi because they can have hyperphagia, the, I haven't seen a single person who has both Angelman and Prader really, usually they have an epi mutation. So they have an imprinting defect um, and have Angelman, um, mosaic Angelman. Okay. Someone asked a question in the yeah. chat too. Oh, go ahead, Paige. Sorry. No, go ahead. No, go ahead and go ahead. <laughs> oh, when giving a family a diagnosis, what are the difference of the PWS types that you can inform the family of. Um, so, you know, there's many papers in the medical literature about genotype phenotype correlation in Prader Willi. The ones that stand out the most are that um, individuals who have uniparental disomy seem to have an increased risk of psychiatric phenotypes and autism. So, in particular, um, what's called psychosis in the medical literature, which should, I don't think should be called psychosis for Prader Willi. Um, but, um, you know, definitely the psychiatric phenotypes that we, you know, monitor very closely can be more significant in individuals who have UPD. Otherwise, you know, there's a mix of medical literature of what to think about or be worried about with the different subtypes that, in larger studies haven't proven to be particularly true. Like for example, there are some studies that say that from an, a cognitive standpoint, UPD is less significant than a deletion. Um, some more aggressive behavior in individuals who have a deletion, there's, there's many reports, but nothing that I would say is as clear as the, the associations with UPD. Yeah, that's a, a common question. What does the subtype mean? What what do I have to look forward to? Um, so that is that's definitely a question I feel like we get a lot too. We are excited about this Echo series and plan to do more of them, like I said. So thank you for attending. And um, if you have any questions, again, please reach out, info at pwsausa.org. And we will be happy to answer them or put you in contact with other professional uh, providers. And thank you all for your time tonight. And thank you for those of you who are taking care of um, individuals with Prader-Willi syndrome. We, we all appreciate you.